Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, The Merry Widower, starring Reginald Gardner. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Suspense. This is the man in black here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood brings you as star Mr. Reginald Gardner and a suspense play in grim three-quarter time. And so, with The Merry Widower and with the performance of Mr. Gardner, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! Listen to me. My good woman, pray, what is the meaning of this intrusion? What? Oh, hello, Ethel. I say, who do you think you're calling my good woman? Well, for a moment, I didn't know who it was, that's all. You didn't know who it was? Well, who did you think it was, the servant? Please, Ethel. Not that it wouldn't be nice if we did have a servant. We shall, my dear. We shall. Of course, that's what you say. That's what you always say about everything. Sometimes I wonder why I ever married you, George Muncy. It hasn't changed my life much. When I met you, I was waiting on people all day long in Hoffman's restaurant, and now all day long I wait on you. Uh, you don't think by any chance, do you, that I'm unworthy to be waited on? <laughs> that would be amusing. Oh, George, it isn't that. I'm no snob, and you know it. And I'm not afraid of a little hard work, either. But you're always making such great plans and such big yes, promises. Yes, well, I have big plans. Someday you'll realize, my dear, that you've married a rather remarkable man. Well, remarkable man. If you don't hurry up and get down to work, you'll be fired. I'm not going to work this morning. You're what? I said I'm not going to work this morning. George Muncy, are you crazy? What? What, what did you say? What's come over you lately, anyway? Ah, then you've noticed something. I should say I have. Wearing wing collars in the daytime all of a sudden and buying yourself a fancy hat and a cane. Really, Ethel, it's quite appropriate that I should wear a Homburg hat and carry a walking stick. After all, I... Appropriate, is it? Well, I haven't had a new hat since I can remember, and you know how we have to scrape along here, and now you're not going to work. Well, where are you going? I'm going up to London. London? Yes, there are certain very important affairs that I must take care of in London, my dear. Just what are these very important affairs, Your Royal Highness? Hmm... Why did you call me that? Because you act so high and mighty sometimes. Oh, George, why can't you be a little more practical? My dear, has it ever occurred to you that I might be different from other men? Oh, George, you are. I know you are. In most ways, you're the most wonderful husband a girl could ever have. But really... Yes, perhaps it's time. Yeah, I think it is. Time that I took you into my confidence. Well, perhaps it's time I took you into mine. There's just ten shillings sixpence in the house to buy groceries for the rest of the month. Please, Ethel, don't be sordid. Sordid? Well, if you think three meals a day is so sordid, all of us... Shut up! George! You're not fit to share my confidence. You're not fit to share my confidence or my station. George! 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 Encore! Encore! I've seen it now for the twelfth time within as many weeks. And again, as on each previous occasion, I'm all but overcome by the one astounding, incredible, and yet quite simple fact. The story being played upon the stage is my story. And the hero of that story, the dashing Prince Danilo of Marsovia, is myself. The time is not yet ripe for me to return and take my rightful station in my country. All this must, for a little longer yet, remain my secret. 
Ethel has no suspicion yet, that's obvious, but there is one who knows, and I'm sure of it. Although she's far too tactful to say so, my lady of the veil. And she'll be waiting for me again tonight, that I'm sure of, too, in the lobby of the theater after the performance. I can't Ah, fair lady. It's you again. My, this is a coincidence. Uh, no, no, I'd set my heart on meeting you again. May I walk a little way with you, fair lady? If you like. Shall we go through the park? If you like. So we meet again. You must be almost as fond of the play as I am. Fond of it? <laughs> well, that's hardly the word for it now, is it? But I suppose you have some special reason. Ah, then you do suspect me. Oh, now, one doesn't have to be a mind reader for that. Every young man in town is halfway in love with the merry widow as it is. Not every young man, fair lady. Remember, the prince himself does not return her love until the very last. Well, that's so. That's as it must be, fair lady. <laughs> if you don't stop calling me fair lady, I shall have to start calling you Prince Charming. <laughs> uh, shall we sit here? Ah, you know something. What? You've never told me your name. Haven't I? No. What is your name? My name? Why, as a matter of fact, it's Prince. Prince? And what's your first name? My first name? Yes. Daniel. Daniel Prince. Well, that's rather like the name in the play. Daniel Prince, Prince Danilo. It is rather like, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, don't you want to know my name? Oh, I, I know it. It's, it's Sonia. No, it's Hilda. Hilda Calamere. Oh. Well, I must say you're not very curious. Don't you want to know anything more about me? Whether I'm married Why, or... Why, you're a widow. Why, so I am. However, did you know? Lift your veil, fair lady, and let me see your face. Well, since my bereavement, I may seem a little older than you, even a few years older. It's not one's age that matters, but who one is. Oh, that is so true. Daniel, are you married? Married? No. Well, I, I don't see why you act so skittish about it. But I suppose you're like all the rest. You've a guilty conscience. No, I have not. Some liaison with a pretty barmaid, like the prince in the play. That's it, isn't it, Mr. Well. Prince? <laughs> yes, there. Well, there is a little liaison, yes. And now you're tired of her, and you're wondering how to break it off. Is that it? Yes. My poor Prince Charming. Uh, Miss Calamere, if you could help no. me, I... No, Daniel. That's something you must do for yourself. But I can tell you this. It's best to be strong about it. Break it straight off, open and above board, like a true gentleman. Isn't it now? Yes. Yes, of course. And things like that are always so unsatisfactory for, for a young man of your station in life, aren't they? My station? Yes. Well, what's that? Why, 12 o'clock, I expect. I'll, I'll have to hurry. Daniel, wait. Where are you going? Home. George? Is that you, George? Yes, my dear. Oh, I must have fallen asleep waiting for you. What time is it? A little after one, I think. After one? Where in the world have you been all this time? I told you this morning that I had certain very important matters to attend to in London. And what are these important ma matters, may I ask, that keep you out until one o'clock in the morning? Ethel, <clears throat> uh, tell me, uh, do you believe in morganatic marriages? In what? Morganatic marriages. Whatever's that? When a person of royal blood marries someone beneath his station. Well, I never thought about it. I don't see what's wrong with it if they're both in love. Why in the world do you ask me a question like that? I just wanted to know what you thought. You are an odd one. I still don't oh, Please, see. Ethel, I'm, I'm very tired. I think we should get to bed. All right. I don't want to quarrel with you tonight of all nights. George. Yes? 
I did an awfully foolish thing today. What? I spent all our money, or most of it. Here, look what I got. What's that? A little box. It's for cigarettes or hairpins or whatever you like. But when you open it, it plays that tune you like so much. See? Well, that was very thoughtful of you, Ethel. It's really quite appropriate. Here now, I didn't get it for you. Look, look what else I got. Well, what are those? Why, you can see what they are, a sand bucket and a sailboat. Well, why did you get them? Oh, I know it's silly and all, but... George, if we were to have a baby... A baby? Yes, mind you, I didn't say we will. It's impossible. Why, it's not impossible, either. I tell you it is. It's not the way the thing should happen at all. The way what should it's happen? It's all wrong. It's, it's not fitting to my station... It can't happen. Oh, it can't. Well, if I want to have a baby, it's little enough I get out of life. Ethel! George, I thought you'd be happy if you thought that... (laughs) Of course, my dear, of course, yes. The the idea just came as something of a surprise, that's all. Then then you mean... Well, let's talk about it in the morning, my dear. I, I think now I shall take a bath. A bath at this time of night? Good for the nerves, you know. Relaxing. Well, do hurry, then. Shan't be long. George! I can't hear you. Oh, it's no great matter. Well, what is it? Why don't you come in here and talk to me? Well, all right. George, don't you think a baby would like this music box? It, it is rather sweet, is it? Oh, I thought you were going to take a bath. I've changed my mind. George, what are you doing? Look at... I'm falling out! <laughs> thing kept playing as she lay there in the water. I looked at her very closely. It wasn't necessary now to do anything more. There was a deep bruise on her forehead just above the temple. She was no longer breathing. I got my hat and my walking stick. I left the house. Tonight for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you The Merry Widower by Robert L. Richards based on Roy Vickers' short story, The Rubber Trumpet. Reginald Gardner is the star of tonight's study in Suspense. In many foreign lands, wine connoisseurs could propose this toast. California has given us this superb wine, so delicate, so excellent in taste and bouquet, that we import it. It is famous Roma, California wine. Yes, that is true. For in Roma wines, you will find the uniform qualities which make a wine truly magnificent. More Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine for greater enjoyment of meals, for delighting their guests. These delicious Roma wines are the result of California's perfect soil and climate, plus a combination of old-world winemaking skill and modern knowledge that mean constant quality. Yet they cost you only pennies a glass. Tomorrow, before dinner, serve an appetizing glass of cool, amber-gold Roma California sherry. Then, with the meal, serve cool glasses of hearty Roma Burgundy. Ah, there is a real treat indeed. No matter what the meal or what glasses you use, the result is the same. New compliment-rousing enjoyment of the meal... New pleasure from even the simplest foods. Try this easy, inexpensive way to better living tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for R-O-M-A, Roma Wine. If your dealer is out of Roma, please try again soon. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Reginald Gardner in The Merry Widower. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Shall I tell you more? Yes, I believe I shall. You've been very attentive, and it pleases us to have you share our confidence. Very well, then. At the performance that evening, the lovely widow and I sealed our betrothal. Uh, Miss Calamere. Why, it's my Prince Charming. Oh, Miss Calamere, 
May we have our walk again, please? Why, of course. Billy, I hardly expected to see you at all this evening. You know, you were rather a naughty boy to leave me so suddenly last night without a word or anything. Yes, I suppose I was, but... uh... You were going home, you said? Yes, to my lodgings. Oh, of course. Tell me, uh, did you enjoy the performance tonight? I didn't see it. I don't want ever to see it or hear it again. Oh. Daniel, do you have something to tell me? Yes. Is it about your... about her? Yes. Did you do as I told you? Yes. It's finished. My poor dear boy. And that's why you don't want to hear the music anymore. Because it reminds you of things you'd rather forget. Yes. That was very good of you, Daniel. And very brave. I hope it wasn't necessary to hurt her too much. No. It didn't hurt her very much. And what are your plans I've now? I've come to you, Miss Callum. I, I've come to you. Daniel... You mean... You're the only person in the world who understands me, Miss Calamere. Oh, my Prince Charming. It's like a dream, like the play that brought us together. We are the play now. Until death do us part. Yes, until death do us part. It has come off precisely as it should have. I've married the lovely widow and we... She'll live happily ever after. She has a fine home and her own income, and it's very fine, and she's very good to me, and very tactful, too. She never refers to my true identity or to the imposter who continues nightly to play out my life upon the stage. At her suggestion, I've taken a position in a London chemist shop for my self-respect, she says, but of course she means the better to disguise my true name and station until the time comes. Now, each morning, she walks down with me as I go to work. Now, Daniel, be sure and stop at the hatters on your way home and pick up your new Hamburg. I bought it especially for you. Yes, my dear. I'm sure it'll be very becoming. And uh, now, let me see. Oh, yes, this is the day you're paid, isn't it? Yes, so it is. You know, I've been thinking you should have your own bank account. What would you say to that? Whatever you think best, my dear. Very well. But uh, bring the money home as usual, and I'll arrange it all for you tomorrow. Yes, my dear. Well, here we are. Mind you, come right home after work and don't be late. We're having something very special for dinner this evening. I shall, my dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, Daniel. Oh, well, there you are. Well, good morning, Mr. Arrowsmith. Not late again, Prince. I'm sorry, Mr. Arrowsmith. Well, being sorry isn't enough. This is the second time this summer. See if it don't happen again. Yes, Mr. Arrowsmith. Now, 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 get them fancy togs off and into your work coat with you and buy that counter. Yes, sir. Here's something new I want you to pay attention to. It's a novelty I want you to try out, see? I'm putting it in your counter. Oh, very good, Mr. Arrowsmith. You have to demonstrate it, so look sharp here. Yes, sir. It's a cigarette box. When you open it, it plays a tune like this. You see? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it, I say. What? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. But you see, I'm quite allergic to music. Oh, you are, are you? Well, mind you, don't talk to me in that tone of voice, or you're liable to find that I'm allergic to keeping you on here. You understand? Yes, sir. And uh, here's your pay. The sixpence dock for that glass you broke Saturday. Thank you, sir. And mind you, give some attention to trying to sell that music box. Allergic or not allergic? Yes, sir. Oh, hello, Prince. I was all around the old man. Oh, nothing at all. Just a minor difference of opinion and a matter of policy, that's all. Matter of policy, eh? Oh, here, what's this? Uh, Don't touch it. What's wrong? Has it got a snake in it or what? It's a very delicate piece of mechanism. Well, let's see. Oh, oh, I say. Give it to me. Well, you are edgy. Why, you look as though you'd seen a ghost. A ghost? At the lunch hour, I took the wretched thing out to the back of the store. I smashed it to bits and threw it into the rubbish bin. It had been priced at seven and six. And I rang it up on the cash register. I say, Prince. Yes, sir? Where's that music box? I sold it, sir. You did, eh? Well, that's jolly good. Nice to have you show a bit of initiative for a change. Thank you, sir. Here, here you are. Here's another one. What? Salesman talked me into buying three dozen of them. 
Thought for a while I'd be stuck with them, but I guess that's going to be you that's stuck with them, eh, Prince? <laughs> that's it. Now it's you that's stuck with them. Three dozen. Yes, sir. I'll get rid of them, I'm sure. Well, come on, Prince. Let's go have a spot of lunch together. Eh? No, no. I'm, I'm going home to lunch today. I must uh, get something very important. <laughs> Well, good night, Bertie. Hi, Prince. Good night, Mr. Aversmith. Good night. Oh, Prince. Yes, sir? Uh, how did you do all of those musical cigarette boxes, hmm? They're all sold, sir. What? All three dozen? Yes, sir. You see, a, a gentleman came in and said he wanted them for an orphanage, sir. Three dozen musical... Well, that's a nice traveling bag you have there. Genuine alligator. Pretty expensive, eh? Yes, sir, it is. It's, uh, it's my wife's. Three dozen musical cigarette boxes for an orphanage. Why, the fellow must have been insane. Oh, no, he was quite sane, sir. As sane as you or me. Well, good night, Prince. Good night, sir. Can you spare a poor man a copper, Governor? Yes. Here, here's a shilling. Oh, God bless you, Governor. But there's something you must do. I want to give you something else. Oh, what? Here, take this suitcase. It's yours. You can do anything you like with it. Here. Yeah. What's the game, Governor? There's no game. I'm just tired of it, that's all. It's a good bag. You can probably pawn it for a nice price. What's in it? Do you want it or don't you? Well, all right, I'll take it. But I hope you don't have your wife a gap in it or something. Then take it and shut up. <laughs> Yes, my dear. Well, it's about time. I've been looking for my alligator bag. Do you... Oh, yes, I, I was about to tell you, my dear. I, I borrowed it. Borrowed it? What for? Where is it? It was stolen. Stolen? Well, uh, how? You see, I was riding on the underground, and some chap grabbed it and dashed out of the door with it before I could stop him. My beautiful bag. Oh, Daniel, how could you have been so careless? Well, it can't be helped now, my dear. I'll save up and buy you another one. Stolen. Well, at least we can phone the police. Police? Well, why not? That's what one usually does about stolen belongings, isn't it? It's not the slightest use, my dear. Well, there's no harm in it. Oh, I'll answer it, Daniel. Yes? Why, yes, my husband and I were just... Yes. Yes, that would be if... Oh. Well, that is odd. Why, yes, come right up. Yes, we'll both be here. That was the police, Daniel. They found my bag. No, th no, they couldn't They have. saw a beggar carrying it. They thought it looked odd, such a nice bag, and they found my name on it inside. Oh. Daniel, it was full of music boxes. Thirty-six of them. All right, then. They were down at the store. They got on my nerves. And, Daniel, they all played the same piece of music, the tune from our play that you used to like so much. That's right. And you hadn't ever wanted to hear again. Hilda. Since... Well, Daniel? I'm... I'm very tired, Hilda. I... I'm going to take a bath. Daniel, I want to talk to you. Very well. You may talk to me while I run my bath. Daniel, something's happened. You're different. I'm no different. Well, why do you hate that piece of music so much? Enough to do such a crazy thing. Uh, what? Well, it's because of... It's because of her, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> no. What did you do that night? You killed her. Oh, who are you? I am His Royal Highness, Prince Danilo of Marsovia. <laughs> What I have done, I have done in the interest of my royal house and of my kingdom. And what I am about to do... Oh, that, that, that is the police. I'll go send them away. Daniel, open that door. Let me out! Daniel!
What do you want? I'm Inspector Davis. Scotland Yard. That's him. Oh, George. Careful. Oh, George, why did you leave me? I'd fallen in the bathroom and cracked my head. And when I woke up, you were gone. You would have fallen? We've been trying to find you for this lady for quite a while, Mr. Muncie. <laughs> All we had to go on was your taste in music. Oh, George. And when this bag showed up with the music boxes in it... Uh, by the way, is this your other wife's bag? Oh, George, there was someone else. Ah, so you don't want to answer, eh? Well, you'd better call the other lady down here, Mr. Muncie. It looks as though you'd have to answer to a charge of bigamy, my lad. <laughs> bigamy. <laughs> bigamy. <laughs> bigamy! <laughs> I have been returned at last to my rightful place and have taken up residence at my castle in Arsovia. There are heavy bars upon the window for the protection of my royal person, and I am most courteously treated by all my court attendants. Even now I hear the approach of my prime minister, whose quaint conceit it is to call himself my doctor. He has been on a personal errand at my request. Did you get it? Did you bring us what we asked? Yes. I managed to find one. Here it is. Ah, yes, yes. That is it. We thank you. Doubtless it seems a trivial thing, a mere trinket... But it reminds us of so many things that we cannot quite remember, like some dream of another life. And it will serve to take our mind from cares of state, which is most necessary, since we know that now we shall be here all the rest of our life. So closes The Merry Widower, starring Mr. Reginald Gardner. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Yes, Roma wine makes any meal taste better. Simply place a cool bottle of your favorite Roma wine on the table with the meal. Serve it in any kind of glass. Once you taste the addition these delightful wines bring to the zest and savoriness of even the simplest dishes... You'll wonder why you've ever done without Roma wines. Remember, it costs you only pennies a glass to add the extra pleasure of Roma wines to your daily meals. Tomorrow, ask your dealer for R-O-M-A, Roma wines. Try them, and you'll know why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Reginald Gardner appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of the Daryl F. Zanuck Technicolor production, Wilson. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Lucille Ball as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>